Well, Father, we ask your guidance now what we're about to do in the leadership of the Holy Spirit from the Word of God. Pray might give an answer of peace from your Word. And we look to thee in this hour to be our teacher and open our eyes. We might behold wondrous things out of thy law. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. My body shoot. Yes, ma'am. In Paul's teaching? Yes. All right. Uh, these references, you couldn't say these things were direct, but I'll show you some things that are off close to it. Uh, first of all, get uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And then also get 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. 1 Corinthians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you. There's a birth. I have begotten you through the gospel. So the conversion there is likened to a birth. In that case there, the man that led the man to Christ is given credit for being the father of the birth. I have begotten you through the gospel. Right, the next one is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this one here, uh, Paul is talking about his own conversion. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So Paul likens his conversion to a birth. And the conversion of converts to a birth. Now, uh, one more, Ephesians chapter 2. And Ephesians chapter 2. Although this thing is not given as a birth, it's given as a resurrection from the dead. And uh, it's given as a picture of somebody that was in one condition and something happened to them to get them in a different condition. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You at the quickened who were dead in trespass and sin. Uh, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sin, the quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, but the raise us up together. Now that says the unsaved man before he's saved is dead. So if he has life when he receives Christ, he's quickened. Then you have a man who's dead and he's given life. That's a birth. And obviously that's not a first birth. Obviously that's a new birth. So there's nothing on it directly, but those three things indicate that the that salvation when a man receives Christ is a birth and it's a begetting and he has a spiritual father and he has life whereas before he was dead. Now the one or two others so uh, get uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3 and notice the new Christian is spoken of as a baby. 1 Corinthians 3 1. And of course a baby has been born. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as a babies, babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, that's what a babies, not with meat hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. So in these passes, the new Christian is called a baby who has to grow on milk. So although there's not a reference to saying the person has to be born again or granted a new birth, yet the indications are strong. Let me show you another one, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit again, of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. That's a child. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So it's a child, and the child has been begotten, and the child has life whereas before the child was dead. So though there's no such thing there as born again, still the reference is like in the Christian salvation to the new birth. All right, something else. Yes, sir. You say it looks like there's nothing anybody could do to fake it? <laughs> All right, First Corinthians chapter, First Corinthians chapter 14, and First Corinthians chapter 1. 
Now, it's amazing how much can be done to fake it. For example, I can stand here now and say to you, I can say, Alika be some halt to two masiket kubuntuk wagang magala manu kanakukubru. And all I've done is talk Filipino to you. But a Filipino probably wouldn't get it because that's Pampangan dialogue, and you've got Ilocano and Vinsayan and Tagalog and everything else. Well, none of these fellows, these charismatic fellows, stop in the street and they said, You got the initial evidence of the baptism, the Holy Ghost talking in the tongues? And I said, Sure. And I gave him Eath Shanayim Shalosha Barbe Misha Shisha Shibu Shimona. That's a bunch of Hebrew. And then just for a little bit of, I put, you know, Canto Nayores, Porque Cantando Sele Gonesili Tolindo, I threw a little Spanish at him. And then just to make sure I wound it up, I put Vende Alp and Rose and Vidra Blue in his Kommenheim Suruk, I threw some German at him, see. And by the time I put German, Spanish, and Hebrew at him, he didn't know where he was at. And he said, well, you weren't in the spirit. And I said, the Bible said, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, none of his. If I don't have the spirit, I'm lost. But I knew what he meant. He said, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And I said, ah, oh, nuts. And I made up my mind, if anybody ever put that on me again, I'd, uh, I'd fool him. So the next time a charismatic asked me that, I said, do you talk in tongues? I said, yes, I do. And I put back my head and went in my act. See, I knew what he meant when he said in the spirit. He meant a Hollywood show. Yeah. That's what he meant. So I went on and said, yeah, should I am And this charismatic clapped her hand and said, he's got it, he's got it, he's got it. <laughs> I thought to myself, why you silly ass, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> All right, now, 1 Corinthians 14, 22, about the tongues. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. Now, you want to mark that. You never a charismatic in your life, tell you that, what they're for. PTL pulling the leg went on for about eight years, and nobody that show ever told you what a sign were, uh, tongues were. They're for a sign. That's what it says. All right, now, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. 1 Corinthians 1, 22, whoever demonstrated tongues in front of you forgot to ask you whether or not you were a Jew. 1 Corinthians 1, 22, for the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek wisdom. The signs are Jewish, and the Jews require a sign, and tongues a sign. Well, I come to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, and notice that tongues are an apostolic sign because all the apostles are Jewish. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patient signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So the signs are apostolic. And that's why you find them in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Amen. And those signs being apostolic are given to Jews because the Jews require a sign. Now come to Mark 16. Notice how this thing is sewed up. So the only people who have tongues are either Jewish apostles or somebody led to Christ by a Jewish apostle. And once the Acts of the Apostle ceases, the signs cease. Mark 16, 15. Mark 16, 15. Go ye in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs, there they go. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. There it goes. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hand on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord has spoken to them, Jewish, circumcised, pork abstaining, Sabbath observing, temple worshiping Jews, nobody he gave that to could eat pork. Peter didn't find out they were able to eat pork till Acts chapter 10. Nobody gave that thing to, went to a local church, there weren't any local churches, they went to the temple. Nobody gave that thing to, went to church Sunday morning. They were Jews and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Verse 20, And they, the apostles, Jewish, went forth and preaching everywhere where the Lord working with them, the Jewish apostles, and confirming the word with signs following. See that? So the sign then lasts only as long as the apostles ministered Israel. And when God's through with Israel, then the sign cease. All right, come to Acts chapter 28, and notice when this thing is. This thing lasts as long as the apostles last. And the apostle last is over. Acts 28, Acts 28, 28. Uh, once in a while, the Lord plays some strange thing in the Bible to show you uh, some markers and signposts. And, of course, the charismatics are not Bible students. There isn't a charismatic around the United States knows enough Bible to teach a daily vacation Bible school. They don't, uh, they're ignorant, very ignorant people, very stupid people. 
And some of them are good people. Some of them are nice people. And they're sweet people and respectable people and wonderful Christians. <laughs> but they couldn't find a bowling ball in a bathtub <laughs> when it comes to finding the truth in the Word of God. And the reason why is they major in love and feelings. And they don't major in truth. Acts 28, 28. Be it known therefore to you the salvation of God is sent to who? Gentiles. Gentiles. And they will hear it. God ceases dealing with Israel in Acts 28. So the signs stop. Now do you know how you know those signs stop? Turn to 2 Timothy. It's absolutely certain you can't possibly miss it. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 20. If there's any question about it. Paul wrote 2 Timothy long after Acts 28. Many years after Acts 28, when Paul was about to be beheaded, he wrote these words. 2 Timothy 4.20 Arasus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum, what? Sick. What's the matter, Paul? Can't you heal him? How come he left him sick? Look at this one here. 1 Timothy, well, written right before he died, after Acts 28. 1 Timothy chapter, 1 Timothy chapter uh, uh, 3, or 4, or 5, make it 5. 2 Timothy 5, verse 23. Why, Paul could heal people by handkerchiefs taken from his body. How come he left one of his buddies sick? Paul could raise dead people. How come he couldn't heal his buddy? 1 Timothy 5, 23, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Recommended medicine, stomach medicine to Timothy. Why? Timothy is sick, and thine often infirmities. How come Paul couldn't heal him? Does the Bible say, They'll lay hand on the sick, and they shall recover? Why, Paul's healing people through the book of Acts right and left. One time he raised a dead man, and Timothy gets sick, and he can't heal him, and Erastus gets Sick and Trophimus gets sick and he can't heal them. What's the trouble? The signs are gone. The signs are gone. The book of Acts is over. Now, tell me the way you know that. You know that because if a man had the gift of healing, like these pastors say, what would he be doing with a, with a healing tent? Or, or, or Roberts with a dentist, a, a, a medical school, and a hospital. What's the hospital for? You say the sick, hey man, if you lay hand on the sick, you don't need a hospital. He, he didn't say if you lay hand on the sick and they have faith to believe and only believe and send them an offering to release their faith, they might be healed. He said they'll lay hand on the sick and they shall recover. Amen. Now a man who has the apostolic signs doesn't have to counterfeit anything. A man with the apostolic signs can walk down the street and his shadow can heal people. Amen. Turn to Acts chapter 4. You don't have to worry about that. He might even lay hands on them. The fellow got the apostolic sign, and boy, they get, they get saved when he walks by. <laughs> oh, Acts chapter, Acts chapter 5, verse 15. Acts 5, 15. I bet you never saw Copeland and Gorman and Roberts pull off that one. <laughs> Acts fakey, fakey, bunch of biggest fakes that ever lived. A bunch of them came to Pensacola one time, and I told one of them, I said, when are you going to walk out there in the bay? Amen. He said, what do you mean? I said, you told me that Christ said... Because I go to the Father, works you'll do a greater works than I do. You'll do because I go to the Father. And you believe that, don't you? Yes. Well, he walked on the water. Let's see you walk on the water. You didn't find Catherine Coleman skating around out here in the bay in Seattle. She drowned. <laughs> Acts chapter 5, verse 15. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them in beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about to Jerusalem, bringing the sick folk to them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one, no mistakes, no wet fuses, no short rounds, every one was healed. So you find there's a big difference between charismatic Christianity and biblical Christianity. Matter of fact, it's so big that for eight years we called PTL pulling the leg, and when they finally found out, somebody found out Tammy was a dopehead and Jimmy was a fornicator. Everybody said, oh, oh, my God, how awful. And the rest of us said, oh, my God, how normal. <laughs> I mean, there was, no, there was no shock to any of us who knew the Bible. The only people who were shocked were people who had thrown the Bible out the window. And they, they began to call it, you know, pass the loot, you know, and pay the lady and all this and that, which is okay with me. I'm perfectly indifferent. 
Uh, I mean, PTL was never a ministry of any kind. Man, so I was talking to a man one time about this. I forget where, somewhere. And I said, uh, would you tell me what it is about those people that people listen to them? He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm a grown man. I got seven children and ten grandchildren, and I've worked for a living all my life. And I said, even now, if I want to pick up some extra money, I do some painting or something. And I said, would you tell what, what would a grown man be doing listening to that stuff? I can't imagine it. I can't imagine that a man that hunted or fished turning on that stuff and listening to it for five minutes. <laughs> well, we hope that you will send in and get your Jesus Says button and your square foot of Liberty Mountain there. <laughs> My God, what is that? I mean, I never, I never could figure any. If you took, if you took, if you took. Fowell and Humbart and Roberts and Swindle and Schuler and Swaggart and MacArthur and Roberts, the whole bunch, and put them in one room, they couldn't keep me awake for five minutes. And, I, and I, this fellow I was talking to said, well, you know what it is? And I said, well, what is it, man? Tell me. And he said, well, he said, the thing is, people these days, they're cliff dwellers. They live in little condominiums. And he said, all oh, this country, that audience, a bunch of people live in these little boxes. And you see, they work all day long, 40 hours a week in the flap folding department of a box top factory someplace and drink a quart of beer for lunch and nobody talks to them all day long and they fight traffic going to and from their home and they get in a little box and they want somebody to comfort them and make them feel good and pat them on the back because they're lonely and miserable. Nobody knows them. They don't get any recognition. And he said they, don't, they can't fix a garden. They don't have any garden. They can't mow the front yard. They didn't any front yard. And he said they can't go hunting or fishing. They ain't a a live wild animal or a fish within 20 miles where they live. So they get in these little boxes with this box in front of them and they want somebody to pat them on the back and make them feel good. That's what he said. And I got thinking about it. I thought to myself, well, that must be it. There's no explanation for it. Talk about a ministry. I could get more excitement out of a leaky balloon. <laughs> Honest to God, man. If I, if I had a chance, if I had a chance to hear Swindle, MacArthur, and Schuler. On, and swag it one program for an hour with the organ and the specials and the songs or go mullet fishing. I'd go mullet fishing every time. Amen. I'd even flip a coin. So what you got here is you got somebody here who's putting something on. Now, if you want to have to make it sound surreal, I'll give you some examples. At home where I am, one of my church members out in the backyard and the pastor's wife of the charismatic church is walking up down her backyard with a sheet of paper, reading the paper. Hustle Sean down to a bow tie, held to give me a flippity gibbet reading this thing. And, and, my, and my church member stops him and says, what are you doing? And this pastor's wife says, I'm practicing my tongues. And my church member said, you're practicing your tongues? And she said, yes, if you don't exercise your gift, you'll lose it. <laughs> oh, man, man, man. So some of them get pretty proficient at it. Up in Rochester, New York, I had a friend there, and one day a charismatic came there and talked to him, tried to get him to leave a Baptist church and got on his knees, you know, and hostile Shandai, Tai Bo Tai, went through all the mess, you know. And when he got through, my friend said, uh, what's your scriptural authority for doing that? And he said, uh, Mark 16. And my friend went back in the back room in the cap cabinet and got a big bottle of ammonia and brought it back in and said, drink it, drink that. Let's see you drink that. And this guy said, oh, no, 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 that'd be tempting God. <laughs> And my friend said, the same passage that said, speak with new tongues, said they'll drink any deadly thing and it won't hurt them. And he said, yeah, that'd be tempting God. And I said, how do you know you're not tempting God if you don't know what you're saying? See, there's something to that. You know, years ago when I graduated from OCS, we had a fellow give us our final lesson in commands. And the idea behind a command is give your command clearly. And if there's one thing they emphasize, was be clear, be clear, be clear. And if you wonder, I guess that had its mark on me. I guess, I guess I never got over it. The fellow said, I don't care if you even give a wrong command, give it plain. <laughs> so I have talked plain ever since. But when you give a command, you have to breathe out to, to, to project it. It has to be from the diaphragm. That's why when these fellows command, they don't count. They don't, when they count cadence, they don't count one, two, three, four, because you can't project. They count hip, 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 begin an H, see? It's Ho! Oh, it's that. A right flank, harsh. See, it's an, it's you, when you breathe that thing out to project it, you have to blow. So you put H, see? Right shoulder, 
horns. You don't say right shoulder arms. You say right shoulder horns. And the, of course the Marine, they talk in tongues, man. You know. And we had a fella, we had a fella, we had a fella in our battalion in Fort Leavenworth that he had that command of execution hoop down to where he'd cough. Funny thing you heard in your ever heard in your life. Forward, <coughs> you know. And 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 we have the parade, you know, your first battalion up here in your right go, oh, present horns. And funny present horns. Third battalion, present horns. On down the road, fourth battalion, this guy down here and go. I mean, crack the troops up almost every time. Present. <laughs> <laughs> and the day we graduated from OCS, that fellow got up and lined us all up there. I think we were, I think we were at attention. And then he said, Huck her up, horn. And you know, some came with inspection arms, some adjusted the sling, some of them fell out, a couple of them came to parade rest. Looked like ducks in a pond dodging lightning, you know. And, and after that thing was over, he told us what he'd said. What he said was Montgomery Ward. <laughs> Huck her up, horn. You know, you know what you're doing. <laughs> now, when a, man, when a man talks in tongue, the Bible said, if a man give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? The fellow did that in front of you. He didn't edify anybody. Right. It didn't help anything. Baloney. <laughs> Ten cents a pound. <laughs> All right, something else. Yes, sir. Well, the answer to that is the passage you read is given as a warning. And that passage is giving a warning back to anybody reading this book before this stuff takes place. Now, as, you, as you've read the passage, it looks like it's chronological. As you've read the passage, it looks like that out in eternity, there's somebody who makes a lie, there's somebody that defiles, and there's somebody that works an abomination. But that isn't chronological. That's a warning to somebody on backwards. Now, I'll show you how you know that. Look at, uh, look at chapter 21, and in chapter 21, look at that new heaven, new earth, in verse 1. In 21, 1. All right, there it is. Now look at the warning in verse 8. Those are warnings placed to somebody who's reading the text. They aren't, they're not chronological. They're not whoremongers, source and idolaters, and that thing out there, out in eternity in the new heaven and the new earth. Let me show you another one like it. In 22, uh, verse uh, 14, there's the new heaven, the new earth right there, all that kind of business. Look at the warning in verse 15. So those things are not saying that the dogs and the whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and abominable and sorcerers are out in eternity. That's warning somebody in the tribulation of millennium that if they want to get into that city, then they better straighten up, they better believe hadn't practiced those things. So where you've read it, it's a warning to somebody in the millennium that if they want to enter the city, they've got to keep the commandments and got to be right. Yes, ma'am. Um, All right, take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter uh, 26. Get Matthew 26 in one hand, and then get uh, Luke in the other. And sometimes, Luke uh, 5, sometimes he'll tell you whether it's new or not, but sometimes he doesn't. But there certainly is such a thing as new wine and old wine. The Bible is not uh, slow to tell you the difference. All right, Luke 5 and Matthew 26. First of all, Luke 5, Luke 5, verse 37. 
No man putteth new wine in old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottle shall be perished. But new wine must be put in the new bottles, and both are preserved. So there is such a thing as new wine, old wine. Obviously the old wine is fermented, obviously the new wine is not. Now Matthew 26 is the Lord's Supper. Matthew 26, verse 27. Matthew 26, 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, till the day when I drink it, what? New, with you in the kingdom of my Father. Therefore the wine of the Lord's Supper is new wine. Now if there's any doubt in your mind about it, look at verse 29 carefully, and notice that in 29 the word wine is not in the verse. The word fruit is fruit of the vine. People say the Lord had wine at the Last Supper. No, he didn't. Matter of fact, he didn't. He had fruit. Right. And that fruit was new wine because he said, I'll drink it new. Now, what is this? All right, come to Isaiah chapter 65 and notice where new wine is found. Isaiah six, well, 65. Isaiah 65, verse 8. New wine is found in a certain place. It's never found in any kind of a bottle. New wine is in a cluster of grapes. Isaiah 65, verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the what? Cluster. So new wine doesn't come in bottles. New wine is grapes, and you squeeze the grapes out into the bottle. Now, for this operation, turn to Genesis 40. And here's the greatest type of Christ in the Bible, Genesis 40. This will be Joseph. And Joseph's a type of Christ in 152 particulars. And he's in jail, like Christ. And there are two prisoners with him, like Christ. And both of them are hung, like Christ. And one of them is saved, one of them is lost, like Christ. And when he's in the jail, what happens? The bread and wine show up, like the Lord's Supper, like Christ. How do they show up? Genesis chapter 40, verse 9. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, a vine was before me. And the vine were three branches. It was, though it budded and her blossom shot forth. And the clusters there are brought forth ripe grapes, and Pharaoh's cup was my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. That's the new wine. It's in the cluster. The cluster's in his hand, and he squeezed it out into the cup. So at the Lord's Supper, Christ is sitting there with the grapes in his hand and says, I'll henceforth no more drink of this fruit of the vine till the day I drink it new with you. In the, it's fresh grape juice. Christ never touched fermented wine a day in his life, according to that passage. Oh, want something else. Yes, sir. What, with what text? Romans 11. All right. All right. Now the key to this thing here, this passage here in Romans chapter 11, is talking about gospel privileges to groups and not individuals. Now first of all, I'll read the thing as always aimed at an individual. We'll take Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, verse, uh, verse 16. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches, individual people, be broken off, and thou, individual Gentile, Christian, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partake of the root and fat of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, the Jews, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say the branches were broken off, the Jews, that I might be grafted in, the Christian Gentile. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high in the mind, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branch of the Jews, take heed, lest he spare not the born-again Christian. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell, the Jews are lost their salvation and severity, but toward thee the Christian goodness, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you'll be cut off and go to hell. And they also, if they, the Jews, abide still not in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to craft so forth and so on. Now, when you read it that way, then it looks like, well, you got saved, and if you're not careful and you quit believing, then you're going to go to hell and you're going to lose it. 
And so that's a verse used by people who can talk about the Christian losing his salvation. Now keep your hand Romans chapter 11 there, and we'll come back to it in a minute. And we'll go to Timothy, get 2 Timothy chapter 2. And notice we've got a real problem here. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we find if a Christian quits believing, he is still saved anyway. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. And notice a different context. In Romans 11, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. In 2 Timothy, he's talking about the individual Christian. 2 Timothy 2, 11. It is a faithful saying, if we be dead with him, we shall live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. What, salvation? No. Verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Then he'll deny you something, verse 12, but he won't deny you himself, verse 13. What he'll deny you, verse 12, he'll deny you a reign. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. Now, that's that case, that unfaithful servant. He came back and he said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I rule over ten cities. Well done, thou faithful servant. I have five cities. One fellow said, Take what he has and give it to the rest of them. He denied that fellow something. But not salvation. Now, he said, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithfully, cannot deny himself. Doctrinally speaking, I am part of Christ, Christ part of me. If he denied me, he'd be denying part of himself. Ephesians 5 says, I am bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, with members one of another. He that has joined the Lord is one spirit. I am in him, he's in me. So if he were to deny me, deny part of himself, he's not going to do that. If you get saved and are born again, you know what you could do? You go around saying, I'm not saved, I'm an atheist, I'm going to hell, and you go to heaven anyway. Of course, you might take a shortcut. Lord might get you out of the way quick so you'd do a lot of damage. But you're still going. Now come back to Romans chapter 11, let's read it right this time. Romans chapter 11, the, the whole subject of that entire chapter is the Jews as a people and the Gentiles as a people, not individuals. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse 11. I say then have they stumbled, they should fall. God forbid that rather through their fall, the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles. He's talking about groups. Now 13 should end the matter. I speak to you Gentiles, not Christians. Some have made a mistake. I think that passage was written to Christians. That passage wasn't written to Christians. Verse 13, I speak to you who? Gentiles. The passage is aimed at the Romans, not at a bunch of saved people. Right, now keep your hand in Romans chapter 11 and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 10. And notice how important it is that you get the distinction between a Christian and a Gentile. 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Because when God deals with groups of people, he always deals with three groups. And those groups are the Jew, the Gentile, and the Church of God. The Church is this body. The Church has neither Jew nor Gentile in it. But outside of the Church, there's Jew and Gentile. 1 Corinthians 10, 32. Give none offense. Neither the Jews, there's your first group, nor to the Gentiles, there's your second group. Nor to the church of God, there's your third group. So when God deals with mankind, he sees them in three groups. A church composed of neither Jew nor Gentile, and then outside that church, Jew and Gentile. All right, now back to Romans 11, verse 13. Now we'll see what we have. What we're talking about in Romans chapter 11 is not an individual Christian being grafted into Christ. What we're talking about here is a bunch of Gentile nations being grafted in the nation of Israel so they have a chance to get saved. 13, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. Verse 16, if the first fruit, that's Israel, be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, parts of Israel, and thou being a wild olive tree, Gentile, Romans, were grafted in among them, and with them partake of the root and fatness of the olive tree. You have a chance to be saved. You have the Jewish Messiah preached to you. It's even further than that. You have a Jewish book dumped in your lap. People don't realize that. Salvation of the Jews. You partake of Israel when you read that book. Every writer in that book is a Jew. I know what Dr. A.T. Robinson said. Luke was a Gentile, but Dr. A.T. Robinson didn't have the sense that God gave a brass monkey on a cold winter afternoon. <laughs> People just get all messed up. Luke was a Gentile. On the base of what? 
He don't know what he's talking about. A.T. Robertson had 22 years of Greek. That fixed him for good. He got Greek artists and flipped out. <laughs> Somebody said, well, Luke's a Gentile name. Well, what do you think Mark is? What do you think John is? John's about to be born, and all of Elizabeth and Zachariah's kinfolk say, you don't have anybody in your family named John. That's a Gentile name. He said his name is John. Well, those names are Gentile names. Just because a Jew has a Gentile name, I don't mean he's a Gentile. What do you think Stephen is? How are you going to get a Jew out of Stephen? I'll tell you a good one, James. <laughs> Why, there, there are more southern boys named Jimmy than any other, other boy. Of all the names down south, the most common name is Jimmy. That's James. What's that? That's Jacob. That's Jacob. That's a Jewish name, Jacob. All right, Romans chapter 11, verse uh, 18. Boast not against the branches, but that thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say the branches were broken off, I might be grafted in. That is an individual. That's a Gentile nation talking. For if God spared not the natural branches, the Israelites, take heed he spare not thee, the Gentiles. Behold the goodness and severity of God to them which fell, the Israelites, severity, but toward thee, the Gentiles, goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, thou shalt be cut off. The thou in that passage is not a man. The thou in that passage is the Gentile nations. If there's the slightest doubt about it, look at this thing on down here in verse 25. For I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery. There's the Christians. Brethren, lest you be wise in your own conceit, that blindness and part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. So chapter 11 is not talking about individual salvation at all. He's talking about the Gentiles' opportunity to hear the gospel when God rejected Israel. Yes, sir. Uh, we often hear about the ministry of the 144,000 being witnesses and preachers in the tribulation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us where we get that from and what their ministry is in the tribulation? All right. Uh, Revelation chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 7, the one of the main reasons why we connect the uh, ministry of the 144,000 with Jewish evangelism in the tribulation is because the immediate context of Revelation 7, 9. After telling you the 144,000 Jews are saved, 12,000 out of every tribe, then you're told this in Revelation 7, verse 9. Revelation 7, 9, After this I beheld a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palm in their hands. So there's a multitude of Gentiles saved after that bunch is saved. And when they're asked where they came from, you're told in verse 14, they came out of the great tribulation. So first, 144,000 Jews are mentioned, and then immediately all these saved Gentiles and their tribulation. So we connect them with the Israelites. Now that's perfectly legitimate because of what you just read in Romans chapter 11, where Gentile salvation is connected with Israel. It's also perfectly legitimate because our salvation as Christians, as individuals, is now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Gentiles get their salvation through Israel. The way in this age, Israel gets his salvation through a Gentile. I've heard Hyman Appleman and uh, David Ben Lou say, or Ben David Lou, whatever his name is, I've heard him say that any Jew saved in this, in this age is saved through his contact with a Gentile. Not all the Jews that ever known, that ever led to Christ, there was a Gentile involved in the Jewish salvation. Now, if that's true in the tribulation, the Jew going to have to help the Gentile out. Now, there's another good reason for it, and that is there's three characters in the Bible that were Jews, and those three characters are called a witness to Gentiles. And all three of those characters picture something in the tribulation. The first of those is Jeremiah. Take your Bible and turn to Jeremiah, and, and notice Jeremiah's commission is not just to the Jews. Jeremiah chapter 1. And if ever you had a picture of a tribulation witness, Jeremiah is the tribulation witness. Jeremiah chapter 1. First of all, get a Jeremiah chapter 1, and then Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 1, here's the commission. Jeremiah 1, 5. 
Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet to the what? Nations. nations. Verse 10. See, I have set this day over the nations and over the kingdoms. Plural. Oh, I come to Jeremiah 25, and here they are. So Jeremiah is commissioned to preach to Gentile nations, and he's a Jew. Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah chapter 25, and here is oh, his commission. Uh, Jeremiah 25, 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel to me, Take the wine cup of the Spirit in my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink of it, so forth and so on. Uh, verse uh, 26, All the kings of the north far and near with one another and all the kings of the world which are upon the face of the earth. Now Jeremiah, the word Jeremiah means cast out. And the term Jeremiah, the term cast out, occurs in the book of Jeremiah 13 times. The book of Jeremiah has 52 chapters. That's a full deck. That's four times 13. And Jeremiah is the only man in the Bible told not to get married or have children. And Christ says the tribulation, woe be to them that give suck in those days. And Jeremiah was up against the, one of the greatest types of Antichrist in the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar. So Jeremiah is plainly a picture of a tribulation prophet, and he is commissioned as the Gentiles. Or right, there's another one like it. And come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and that's the Apostle Paul. We don't often think about it being a type of tribulation preacher. But when he talks about his birth, he mentions his birth as being out of place at the wrong time. 1 Corinthians 4, or 15 rather, 1 Corinthians 15. That one there in chapter 4 was on your birth. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. And it's not being born when he was ready, due time, but born out of due time, at the wrong time, ahead of time. And Paul likened his birth there to something unusual that's out of place. And Paul is born again when he sees Jesus Christ from heaven like the sun, and he's immediately told, you'll be a witness to me, to the Gentiles. Now he goes to the Gentiles. He doesn't get married like Jeremiah. He doesn't have children like Jeremiah. And he witnesses the Gentiles. So Paul's a type. Now there's one other type. And that type is Jonah. And Jonah back in the Old Testament is told to cry against Nineveh, that great city, the preaching I bid thee, and cry against it. That Nineveh is an Assyrian city. You study your Bible, you'll find the greatest type of Antichrist in the Bible, even greater than Nebuchadnezzar, is the king of Assyria. Matter of fact, he's, he's located in Isaiah 10.10. 10. That Pharaoh that persecuted the children of Israel was an Assyrian. He wasn't an Egyptian. He was an Assyrian. And he's called the Assyrian Isaiah 10.10, 10, and he's called a dragon in Isaiah chapter 50. And that's the king of Nineveh. And Jonah goes preaches in Nineveh. So Jonah and Jeremiah and Paul are pictures of Jews called to preach to Gentiles. And they all, all single, none of them get married, all of them preach to Gentiles. And that because of that, you, can, you, can, you can't say for sure. But because of that, you can say the 144,000 are Jewish evangelists called to preach to Gentile nations. But there's one other reason. There are 12,000 from each tribe, right? All right, come to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Nothing like a King James Bible to clean up a seminary. Isaiah chapter 32. Isaiah 32, 7. There are plenty in this book. There are plenty in this book. Isaiah 32, verse 7. I told you passed this morning eating breakfast. I said, I've given up trying to master the Bible. I gave it up. About 20 times ago, about the 91st time I went through there, I said, that's it. I've had enough, man. I'm, my notes are getting all screwed up. I don't know where I'm at. My notes, my notes are crossing each other, and I'm getting lost in my own notes, man. I still read it and study it, but I've given up ever trying to master it. It can't be mastered. You can't master it in your own language. The nuts weren't about Hebrew and Greek. You can't even get them in English. What about the Hebrew and the Greek? Deuteronomy 32, 7. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided the nation of their inheritance. Watch it. When the Most High divided. When he separated. That's the Lord. Division, separation. When the Most High divided to the nations. There you go. 
when he separated the sons of Adam, the Gentiles, he set the bounds of the people, Gentile nations, according to the number of the children of Israel. There are 12 tribes. Then there has to be 12 nations. You've got one Jew evangelizing each nation, one tribe evangelizing each nation. It means those nations match those tribes. And like I said uh, time before, there's a key in here that nobody's ever worked out yet. And I've worked at it off and on for maybe 12, 15 years, and I haven't got it. And maybe the reason why you can't get it is because if you got it, you'd have a glorified Ouija board worked out and just be too much to get a hold of. But you know what you got in that book? I mean, what a book. <laughs> there are nine million books in the Library of Congress. And all nine million of those books combined can't give you the information that's in this book. Amen. Nine million combined. You know what you got here? You got 12 months in a year. And you got 12 tribes to match those months. And there's a birthstone, 12 birthstones for each one of them months. So you got 12 tribes and 12 stone, 12 months. But the tree of life has 12 manner of fruits every month for the healing of the nations. So you got 12 fruits and 12 tribes and 12 nations and 12 months and 12 stones sitting there. But then you got 12 constellations up over your head. Well, you have the new earth. And you got 12 apostles sitting there. Then you got 12 colors. You run that around that wheel and that thing comes out yellow, yellow, orange, 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 red, 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 purple, 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 blue, 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 green, green, greenish, yellow, yellow. Twelve of them, the twelve colors. You start that musical scale. A, B flat, B, C, D flat, D, E flat, E, F, F sharp, G, A flat, twelve notes. Now, you get that thing going, before you get through that thing, you're going to have 12 sets of 12 sitting there that God made, and the things are going to match. They're going to match if a guy could ever work them out. And if he ever worked them out, you know what you'd find? You'd find somewhere on this earth, you see, that's where in every, in every lie, there's always an element of truth. And when Garner Ted Armstrong starts this stuff about the English-speaking people are Ephraim and Manasseh, then that dumb moron, mor I was going to say moron, Mormon, Mormon <laughs> comes into your house and tells you that uh, they're from the tribe of Ephraim. See? There's always a base of truth in a thing like that. But nobody has yet located the truth. And when you get that thing down, as sure as you live and breathe, the United States, England, Russia, China, Japan, Germany are in that book. They're in there. But they're disguised. Don't tell me, especially a country like Germany, don't tell me Germany isn't in the book. Germany killed more Jews than Pharaoh did. God has always been interested in the people who are connected with his people. Here's one Protestant German, Martin Luther, gives the whole world the Reformation, and a Catholic German, Adolf Hitler, kills 22 million people. And they're not in this book. They're in this book. But nobody's ever found it. So the last reason we're assuming that is the number matches the number of nations, so they're probably prophets to nations. And, uh, of course, Jonah is the, Jonah is the, uh, that's the, that's the weirdest character in the whole Bible. Did you ever study that character? You talk about a character getting mad at God, doest thou well to be angry, I do well to be angry even to death. That's how he talks to God. I mean, Lord, kill men for less than that. Onan, you know, displeased the Lord, and the Lord killed him. The other fellow was evil, and the Lord killed him. And the Lord said to Jonah, you mad? You bet your life I'm mad. You got a right to be mad? You bet your right I got a right to be mad. You sure about the Go on, kill me. I'll stay mad. <laughs> Something, man. <laughs> and when a guy gets talking to God like that, the Lord says, now look at here. What about this gourd here? You worried about this gourd here, you know, and upset about that because it took care of you? And I got 120,000 people down there that aren't old enough to count yet. Shouldn't I spare them? And that's how the book ends. It ends with a question mark. Strangest book in the Bible. Thing ends with a question mark on it. That old boy, you mad? I'm mad at the death. Well, look, shouldn't I help them folks out down there? <laughs> that's how the book ends. Jonah is a type of a, a type of tribulation preacher. All right, brother, that's, better take a break now, about five minutes, seven.